today's verse, although it takes the life-changing power of the Lord Jesus Christ to do these things, today's verse is something that even unsaved people can, can live a better life by if they would just practice these things. A very practical verse in the book of James. Actually, only two verses. Yeah, two verses today. All right, but before that, I have my humorous anecdote. I like that terminology. I'm going to start using it. All right, you ladies will like this one. A husband was trying to prove to his wife that women talk more than men. He showed her a study which indicated that men use about 10,000 words per day, whereas women use 20,000 words per day. His wife thought about this for a while, and then she told her husband that women use twice as many words as men because they have to repeat everything that they say. The husband looks stunned and says, what? Get it? He's making her repeat it again. How come you men aren't laughing at that? That was a funny <laughs> anecdote. <laughs> all right, all right, so let's jump into our text for today. James chapter 1, verse 19 and 20. Just a wonderful, little, short, practical, there's no deep, deep doctrine, although there really is kind of deep doctrine into it, but it's just a very, very practical, practical verse. I hope you got an uh, outline. I, I really wasn't going to make one of these today. I kind of fancied it up with pictures and borders and colors and stuff, but my outline is so simple today, but I did make some blanks on there so you can... Fill in, but uh, here's our text today. James chapter 1, we're still in chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. James says this, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Isn't that, isn't that a wonderful, practical, practical verse. Here's my outline, as if you couldn't guess what my outline would be. huh? Quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. Huh? There's a real complicated outline for you today, but I want to try to drive home these simple practical things. Uh, if we would just begin to live this way, it would, it would really change our relationships. It would change. It would just help us immensely in our lives. James tells us to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. All right, let's look at the first one, quick to listen. I changed the word hear. He, in my translation, it, said, it says, Know this, my beloved brethren, let every person be quick to hear. But if you, I think James is really talking about being quick to listen. Okay, there's a, sometimes a difference between hearing and listening. Now, I want to talk about two phases in this. And because many of the commentators I was reading was either taking one track or was taking the other track. Some of them talk about, James is talking about listening in the physical realm, which certainly he was talking about. But then many of the Bible commentaries jumped onto verses talking about listening carefully to what the Lord has to say. We need to sometimes... Um, I was going to say shut up, but some people don't like that word. We need to be quiet and listen to what the Lord has to say sometimes. All right. So first, listening in the physical realm. This is important. It is important for believers to listen to others. That's important. Um, listening shows that we care. It is an act of love to listen to other people. Sometimes they'll take off on a, I got my, I got my haircut done uh, this week, and um, I got this one barber I go to in Granville, she, Lady Barber, which is okay, and I try, I don't know, I still, I'm the old school, I go to barbers. I don't go to these fancy cut places and stuff like that, but, but, but I used to go to this gal in, in Granville, and every time I go in there, she's always complaining, you know, so I, I got to sit there, you know, I'm a captive audience. She's always complaining and talking about people she got into an argument with and this and that and that. So I, uh, my birthday's coming up, so I had to get my <coughs> driver's license renewed. And uh, on the way home, I saw a barber pole out there. So I went and stopped there and I started, uh, and of course, when you're sitting in that chair, 
the barber's got to tell you stories. And this guy started off on a story, and he was throwing in this detail. And uh, it, was, it was a story that he had developed a cancer in the back of his knee, but he had to tell me, you know, everything about it. He had to tell me the conversations he had with the doctors and with the nurses, and then they transferred him and sent him to, to um, Michigan, what is it, Michigan State with the big medical unit and, and, and um, U of M, isn't it? Yeah, and uh, tell me everything, the conversation, you know, the whole haircut, he told me this whole story, you know, and I had just been preparing for this message, <laughs> and I had to say to myself, okay, John, it is important for you to care about this guy. This was a major event in his life. Listen to what he has to say. It is important for us to listen to people. It is an act of love when we patiently listen to people. Being a careful listener many times enables us to minister and to help others. I've had people as a pastor, they, they, I, need to, I need to come and talk to you. And okay, well, let's meet. We sit down and they talk and talk and talk and talk about their problem. And I'm thinking, okay, what am I going to tell them to help them with their problem? And then they get done talking and they say, Pastor, you have been a real help to me. Thank you. You know, <laughs> well, I didn't say anything. <laughs> all I did was listen. And I, all I did was listen. But listening can be a ministering to people's lives. Um, Cross-reference, Luke chapter 2, verses, verse 46. I thought this was very interesting. I typed in the word listen. Of course, the word hear, there's a whole bunch of those throughout Scripture. Israel wouldn't hear the Lord, you know. But, but this was an interesting one in the New Testament, I thought. Luke chapter 2, Jesus is a 12-year-old boy. We see in Scripture hardly anything of Jesus growing up. You know, I'm in the book of James. James was Jesus' younger brother. We often, I said in that introductory message, what was it like for James to grow up with Jesus as a brother? But we don't know. The Bible tells us about Bethlehem, going to Egypt and going back up to Nazareth, you know. But then we hear, we hear one thing about when Jesus was a child. He's 12 years old. They went down for a Jewish holiday to Jerusalem, and apparently many were traveling because Mary and Joseph had relatives that were down there, and the holiday was over, and they're heading back, and they thought, oh, Jesus must be with some of the other relatives, but they met them as they were traveling back up to Galilee, and Jesus wasn't with them. Oh, this boy, what are we going to do with him? So they turned around, they went back to Jerusalem, they hunted around Jerusalem for three days. Three days they hunted for him, and then they finally found him in the temple. But I thought this is an interesting verse. It says this. After three days, they found him in the temple. Jesus was a young boy yet. We don't know. Bible scholars don't know exactly how much Jesus knew of who he was as he was growing up, you know. Did he know he was the son of God? That he was, We don't know that. He was maturing. He was growing says here, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Isn't that interesting? Jesus was sitting among them and he was intently listening to what they had to say. He was trying to learn as he grew up. He was, he was listening to what they had to say and asking curious questions of them. Jesus listened to people. Okay, I was looking at things online. I found an article. It wasn't, it wasn't a sermon, but it was an article by a pastor, a pastor by the name of David Mathis, and I don't know who he was. This was an article on the Internet, but I read it, and I thought it was good. It was good about listening. He's got six lessons in good listening. Okay, so here's a nice six-point sermon. There, there here. But this was, this was an article on the Internet. Pastor David Mathis. Number one, he says, good listening requires patience. Good listening requires that you shut up, that you be patient with those people who got all of those details, that you are you just patiently, oh, I got other things to do, and they're going on and on and on. And I can why why don't they let me go? But good listening requires patience. 
Number two, good listening is an act of love. I said that a little bit earlier, that it shows love. He had this in his article. Good listening, you taking the time to listen is an act of love. And I want to tell you something. The talker, the speaker, maybe the word talker is better, the talker, the speaker, the person that's talking to you realizes this. I want to tell you, my wife, when she was growing up, she was always somebody that these down and outers would, would find and they would, they would cling to her and they would always, always come to her because she was somebody who or is somebody still. I talk in the past tense of my wife. Wait a minute here. She's home sleeping. But she is somebody who listens when you talk to her. And people realize that. And sometimes it gets to be a real, can I say it? Sometimes it gets to be a real pain, you know. But, but, but it is something that we as Christians, we should do. We should be patient with people. Good listening is an act of love. And they realize that. Good listening asks perceptive questions. You know, you, you've seen the... I don't know, TV commercials or you've seen it where somebody's got a talker on the other end of the telephone and they put the telephone down and they, they are doing other things and they pick it up every once in a while. They say, oh, oh yeah, is that right? And then they put it down and they go on and they, they <laughs> you know, you've seen that. They're not listening. Good listening asks perceptive questions. That shows that you are listening. Oh yeah, well, what? What did the doctor say about that? Oh, yeah, how long did that take? You know, you ask perceptive questions to help them with, maybe to help speed the story up a little bit. Huh? You, can, you can do that. Ask perceptive questions. Point number four, good listening is ministering. And I, I had said that just a little earlier. His thoughts run kind of along the same thoughts as mine. Good listening is a ministry. Well, I don't know what to do for the Lord. I want to have a ministry for the Lord. Well, here's something you can start doing is caring about other people and listening to what they have to say. Oh, come on, Pastor Herrick, that's not a real ministry. I want a real ministry. Yes, it is. Listen to what other people have to say. Point number five, good listening prepares us to speak, you know? If you didn't hear what they say, and they get done, and then they say, oh, you know, your mind has wandered. <sighs> and they're telling you a story. And then at the end, all you catch is, so what do you think about that? <laughs> then you're in trouble, you know. <laughs> well, um, uh, well, uh, uh. <laughs> good listening prepares us to speak and to counsel, giving words of biblical counsel to others after they have described the situation they're in, we need to know it. We need to understand it. And number six, six lessons of good listening. Good listening reflects our relationship with God. You want to know something? God is very patient and listening when we're pouring out our heart to him. When we go on and on about, oh, Lord, this is in my life, and, and I'm having problems with this, and Lord, it's a tough situation, and Lord, I, this is really... And we go on and on. You know what? The Lord lovingly, patiently listens to us. And if we're picking up on the character of God, God is building his character into our lives, we will be good listeners. It reflects our relationship with God. I thought those were, it was a good article. It was just an article on the internet. But I thought, hey, these are good points for us to consider in listening. <coughs> this is interesting. Listening spiritually. Now my second part. Listening physically, listening spiritually. Here's a story of Elijah. Elijah was down and out. And Elijah was running. He goes and he hides in a cave and the Lord comes and speaks to Elijah. Look at these verses. And he said, go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. He's in the cave. He said, come out to the front of the cave and, and stand there, and I'm going to talk to you out there. 
And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. It says, but the Lord was not in the wind. Oh, I thought this great big earthquake with rocks falling and wind blowing all over the place now. And a hurricane or a tornado going by, tearing up the mountains. I thought, I thought that would be the Lord talking to me. But it says the Lord was not in the wind. He says, after the wind, an earthquake. Oh, oh, surely, surely this earthquake is the Lord talking to me. It says, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. It says, and after the earthquake, a fire. Oh, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire... Here it is, the sound of a low whisper. That's the way the uh, ESV translates it, a low whisper. The Lord likes to talk to us in a low whisper, and we need to listen. I heard a a teacher say one time, he says, uh, a lot of times teachers make a mistake because the class is noisy, they just start trying to get louder and pretty soon the class is louder and then they're louder and then it becomes a shouting contest. She says, here's a trick I learned. What you need to do is you need to start talking very, very quietly. And then the class will all of a sudden, oh, and then they will all quiet down. The Lord talks to us in a still, small voice. We want to hear the Lord. We want to listen to the Lord. Lord, I want to have your wisdom to know what direction this choice I got. Lord, I need your help in knowing direction in life. The Lord will tell us. The Lord will speak to our heart, speaks to our heart through the Holy Spirit in a still, small voice. A couple of cross-references. John 10, 31. Jesus is talking about he is the good shepherd. The good shepherd. He says this. My sheep, those who truly belong to Jesus, my sheep hear, here it is, hear my voice, and I know them and they follow me. Jesus is referring to a, a, a practice they had in, in biblical days in certain seasons when, when the grass, it was kind of a dry season and the grass was scarce, all of the shepherds would bring their sheep together. And it would be one great big flock and they'd go out to an area where they could find some grass. But at the end of the day, the shepherds would call their own sheep and their own sheep would come to them out of the flock, and all of the other sheep would stay there waiting for their shepherd to call them. Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice, and know I know them, and they follow me. We need to listen to Jesus' voice in our lives. I got one more. This is kind of on the opposite side of the fence. Paul, several places in the New Testament, talks about in the end times, The church is going to deteriorate. And he says that here in 2 Timothy chapter 4. He says this. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound biblical teaching. They're not going to like it. They're not going to like it that Jesus died on the cross. They're not going to like it that they need to receive Jesus Christ as their Savior. They're not going to like good biblical teaching. He says, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. I I like that. They got itching ears. What does that mean? Well, that's a euphemism, a nice way of saying they're only going to listen to people whose message they like. And good biblical teaching, they don't want to hear it. Let's get somebody who's going to come in here and talk about about just wonderful things. And we'll listen to him. You know, there are biblical, there are non-biblical, there are there are big name preachers in our world today, especially in the United States, who even have some mega churches that are like that. Why do they have mega churches? Because people are flocking to hear the wonderful, their ears were itching to hear something different than biblical truth. All right, some cross references there. All right, point number B. Can I say that? Point number B. 
I think I had it one, two, three in my outline, didn't I? Well, <laughs> point number two, just pretend that B is a, is, a, is a two there. James says, not only should you be, oh, here I got it. No, know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, and there it is, slow to speak, slow to come out with something, slow to respond, slow to say things. That doesn't mean this kind of slow. It means that we need to be careful and cautious when we jump in and throw our two cents in. Zeno of Citrium, he's a Stoic Greek philosopher, lived from 336 B.C. to 265 B.C. We have his uh, extant manuscripts of his philosophy as a Stoic philosopher. He said this, though, one time. He said, we have two ears and one mouth, therefore we should listen twice as much as we speak. <laughs> I even think it's probably a little more than that, you know. Uh, but that was interesting that he said that. It gives us that. It goes right along with James. James would probably agree with that. Cross-reference. Proverbs. You know, there are so many similarities between the topics that James picks up and the topics that the book of Proverbs pick up. I talked about that in one of the opening sermons on the book of James. But, but you got a topic in James, and then you can go to the Proverbs and find, find the same topic. i got a number of Proverbs here. Proverbs 10, 19 says this. When many words, when words are many, there we go, transgression is not lacking. When words are many, you talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk all the time, it is very likely that some transgressions are going to start coming out. Huh? Transgressions are not lacking, but whosoever restrains his lips is prudent. Now I'm going to come back to that in just a minute. Let's look at all three of them, and then I'm going to come back to some certain words here. Here in Proverbs 13, verse 3, the author of Proverbs, probably Solomon, said this, Whoever guards his mouth preserves his life. He who opens wide his lips comes to ruin. Comes to ruin. I don't know how you spent your extra hour last night. But I found flipping through channels, you know, that's what guys do. They flip through channels. Are you a channel flipper, guys? I'm a channel flipper. And then I saw it. One of my favoritest, bestest movies of all time. Last night, it was on, and I stayed up and watched it. The man from Slow... Let me say it right. The man from Snowy River. It's a, it's a, a chick flick. He falls in love with this pretty gal, and it's also a man's movie. He's a horseman, and there's a scene in it where they're chasing these brombies, the wild horses, and, and the rich cattlemen, and all of, his, all of his hands are chasing them, and the horse led by this big stallion comes up to this steep slope, it wasn't, you know, a sheer cliff, but this steep slope. And, and they all pull up and they say, whoa. And the boss says, well, you can kiss those brombies goodbye. They were heading down the steep, steep slope and, and, and the other guys didn't, they didn't dare ride down there. But this, the hero of the story, a young mountain man, he was behind because one of the guys tried to slip the halter off his horse and he stopped, put the halter back on. And all of these guys stopped. And he comes riding up from behind, and he, his horse jumps a branch, and he rides down the, the incline of that slope was about like this, you know, and the music behind it, and, and you get all excited about it, and he catches the brown bees, and he brings them back. The, the, anyway, it's just a fun movie to watch, a good movie to watch. In it, um, 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 Kurt Douglas, not the young Kurt Douglas, the old Kurt Douglas, had a daughter, of course she was a pretty daughter, Sig Sigrid, I had to look her up, Sigrid Thornton, an Australian actress, she's older now, this movie came out in the 80s, I think, and uh, anyway, she's a pretty young gal in there, but she's headstrong, and her dad had a temper, and he would fly off the handle, and she wanted something, and finally, Kurt Douglas comes over and slaps her across the face, and she leaves, basically, and she falls off a cliff, and the hero comes and rescues her, you know. And, but anyway, it became very evident in this movie that the, the, the rich 
cattle baron, played by Kurt Douglas. It's kind of interesting because he plays the rich cattle baron and he plays his prospecting brother who lives up in the mountains. He plays both parts, you know. It's kind of, kind of interesting. When they meet, they got one of those camera tricks. But anyway, his life, his family was ruined because of his anger. It was very clear in that movie. All he would do is, is, is blow off steam and yell at people and run off, and, and it ruined his life. Anger can do... Uh, guard your mouth. He who opens wide his lips comes to ruin. Proverbs 17, verse 28, he says, Even a fool who keeps silent is considered wise. I like that. My dad always, my dad, when I, I didn't realize this was a proverb, but one of the things my dad would always say, it's better to keep your mouth shut and let people think you're a fool than to open your mouth and let them know you're a fool. You know, he would always, he would always say that to us. I still remember that. But that's very similar here. Even a fool who keeps silent is considered wise. When he closes his lips, he is deemed intelligent. Oh, that guy over there hasn't said anything. I'll bet you he's thinking these things through. I'll bet you he knows a lot, you know, when he's just over there daydreaming, you know, <laughs> trying to look like he's thinking. All right, three words I want you to see in here. Restrains. When we go to talk, we need to restrain. Give me a synonym from the word restrain. A synonym. The word restrain. What does that mean? Hold back. Hold back. Yeah, that, that's not one word, but that's good. Yeah. We need to hold back. We need to restrain. We want to say something. We want to blurt in. I, I tell you, I, I, did, I did say something to you, but I wanted to put on Facebook yesterday, hey, where are all you smarty pants Ohio State people now? They lost badly yesterday. <laughs> But, but I restrained my Facebook entry. You know, <laughs> Michigan and Michigan State both won in Ohio State, lost horribly. And I got a couple of people who like to rub in, Ohio State won this week, you know. I restrained, I restrained. You know, we need to restrain. We need to be careful. Here's another one. Whoever guards his mouth preserves his life. What is a guard? A guard is a guy who stands by the door and protects and don't let any harmful thing uh, come in is their job. The, I, I, we need to take our guard and we need to turn them around and make sure nothing comes out that's going to damage our life. We need to guard our mouths. We need to guard our mouths. And then lastly, keep silent. Even a fool who keeps silent. Think about those three words. When you want to do a bunch of talking, James says be, slow, be swift to listen. Listen carefully. Let them know you're listening, but don't always be needing to throw your two cents in. Restrain, guard, and keep silent. Do you know what the control Z combination on the keyboard does? Most of us, many of us know on the keyboard you got a control X. What does that do? Control X. Ah, oh, you guys aren't techies. Cut. What does the control C do? Copy. And then right next to it, I don't know where they got it. The control V is paste. Control P is print. There's a lot of these control combination keys. The control Z is one that maybe so many people don't know it. For those who don't know, use a computer. Control Z is an undo shortcut. Now I know in Word you got the undo button, the back arrow up there, but control Z does the same thing. You type something into your computer, realize that it wasn't right, and the solution is easy. Boom! You know, you just hit control Z, what you messed up, what you did said on there. Oh, I better not say that to my boss. And just zip, you know, <laughs> take it all out of there. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could do that in life? You speak a few careless words, and immediately you realize, you immediately realize you shouldn't have said what you said. But you know something? There is not a control Z in things that we say. They're already out there. There's no way to take them back again. Huh? We need to be careful. Okay. Thirdly, letter C. Number three, slow to anger. Slow to become angry. 
Boy, this is how practical. He says, know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. What practical advice that is. He says, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. How many times have we been mad at somebody and we say something like this? Well, you know what? I think here this will solve the problem. I'm going to go to him and I'm just going to tell him off. I'm just going to blow up all over him. I'm going, to, I'm going to tell him the way it is. But you know what? Look at verse 20. You blowing up at somebody is not going to produce anything good for the kingdom of God. Very clear. Now, I know we think of Jesus as he drove the people out of the temple, the, the money changers and the swindlers. There is, in Scripture, we find an element of righteous anger. But very few times do we have a good grasp on right anger. We have our own side, and we think we got the right to go blow up at them James says we need to control our anger because the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. This is these verses from the message. You know what the message is. The message is a, it's not really a translation. It's kind of a, a paraphrase. But the guy, I forget his name now, who did the message, he, he did an interesting job on these. He says, post this at all of the intersections. Dear friends, isn't that interesting? He's just paraphrasing. He's saying it like what he's thinking. He says, lead with your ears, follow up with your tongue, and let anger straggle along in the rear. Isn't that interesting the way the message puts that? God's righteousness does not grow from human anger. I like I liked the message. Sometimes it's kind of interesting reading in the, the message. Realize the message is not a a close, accurate translation, but it is a guy who has taken these verses and kind of rewritten them according to the way he sees them from his mind. It's kind of interesting. Cross-reference, Psalm 103, verses 8 and 9. The Lord is merciful and gracious. Now here it is. Do you see that? Here's an attribute of God, an attribute of godliness that we should emulate in our life. It says... God is slow to anger. Many times we think of God as, oh, God's going to blow up all over us because he's always getting mad and angry at everybody. He isn't. He's very gracious. He is gracious and he is merciful. Meaning, I don't know if this is true linguistically, but many times theologically, do you know what the difference between grace and mercy is? Here's what often they say. Grace is God giving to us good things that we really don't deserve, but he gives them to us. That's grace. Mercy is God withholding judgment that we really do deserve. I think that's kind of a neat distinction. God is merciful. He is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. God is slow to anger. If God is building his character in our life, we need to learn how to control our anger. Cross-reference in Proverbs. Yeah, I got a number of Proverbs here. Proverbs 14, 29, he says, when a sl when, wh who, yeah, Let me say it, right? Whoever is slow to anger has great understanding, but he who has a hasty temper exalts folly or foolishness hasty temper that's what kind of caught my eye with this verse there are people who are have a hasty temper they get mad really quick and all they're doing is exalting foolishness when they get angry there's another one proverbs 19 11 i got four of them here two on each slide he says, good sense makes one slow to anger. Good sense, having wisdom, having knowledge, having discernment, good sense makes one slow to anger. And it, 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 is, and it is his glory to overlook an offense. Isn't that good? 
How many times somebody, I was going to say some dumb skull, but then I changed my mind. I got to calm down here. Somebody uh, does something like cuts you off or pulls over in front of you or the light turns green and then you're behind them and they're sitting there talking on their phone. It is my tendency to right away says, get going. You know what? I've taught Eugene. Shame to say. I've taught Eugene that. He yells at slow drivers in front of me. I don't know, I don't know where he got it from. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Why can't we just overlook those petty little things that people do? I don't know how many times somebody has been in my blind spot and I go to move, oh, whoa, you know, there's somebody there, you know. Can that can I be gracious if they do that to me? You know, we need to overlook offenses. Don't get mad at them right away. Just overlook them. Oh, that's okay. Oh, that's okay. Can you say that? Oh, that's okay. You know, we need to we need to do that. Here's another one. Proverbs 29, 22. A man of wrath stirs up strife, and one given to anger causes much transgression. A person who's got anger in his life and is always blowing up at people, he's going to cause more problems, and he's going to cause sin to happen. Here's another one. Proverbs 30, verse 33. You see how similar James and the book of Proverbs are? It says this. Um, the pressing, for pressing milk produces curds. Now, I grew up on a farm. We didn't make our own butter that way, but my mother did have an old churn in the basement, and there was one time when I was asking about it, and she said, well, let me show you, and we poured some cream and milk in, in there. You know, the milk you get has the cream has all been taken out of it, but the milk that we got out of our car, out of our car, huh? Out of our, our car, I can't even talk this morning, would have the cream all mixed in it. Anyway, she put it in the churn and, and made me pound and pound and pound, press. That word press here really could be punch or pound. Um, and after I pounded those, that uh, for a while it turned into, it really didn't turn into butter, it turned into buttermilk. It turned into cottage cheese. You know, uh, that was interesting for me. The pressing, pressing, pounding the nose produces blood. Alan, I want to illustrate this, if you'll come on up here a minute. <laughs> I just want to illustrate it so that it really will be remembered by them. You, know? <laughs> you get punched in the nose, your nose is going to bleed. huh? <laughs> what the author of Proverbs is saying, these things are true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. put milk into a, a butter churn and you churn it, you're going to get butter. Yeah, you pound somebody's nose, blood's going to come. He says the same way. Pressing anger produces strife. When you get mad and you blow up, all it's going to do, there's going to be repercussions. He's going to get mad at you. He's going to go yell at his wife. There's going to be other people at work. People are going to take sides, and there's going to be a whole big mess because you had to lose your anger. You couldn't control your anger. Paul says in the New Testament, Ephesians 4, verse 26 and 27, I think this is interesting. This should be a scary warning to us. Paul says, be angry and do not sin. Now, why does Paul say it that way? Paul does not say, you should not be angry. Because Paul knows there will be times when we lose our anger. But when you lose your anger... You are in a very vulnerable position to sin. He says, when angry, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Now look at verse 27. Same sentence, just continues right on with the thought. And give no opportunity to the devil to get into your life and ruin something. Because that's what he desires to do. He wants to ruin your testimony. He wants to ruin your life. Paul is saying when you lose control and you become angry, you are opening yourself up for the devil to get into your life and cause havoc. Whoa, I better be a little more careful about losing my anger and yelling at other people. Huh? 
One more cross-reference. Okay, Galatians 5.22. You know what this is. But the fruit of the Spirit. Fruit of the Spirit. Fruit is a, what do we call it? Is, a, is it something that a tree produces? It gets the, le- it, the leaves, get the sunlight, and by the process of photosynthesis, it turns them into nutrients, uh, and it grows fruit. It is a byproduct of its life. Paul says here, and by the way, just before this, Paul was talking about the works of the flesh, and he mentions twice, he mentions anger, and he mentions wrath as works of the flesh, I didn't include those verses, but he says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and I want you to notice this last one in this list. Self-control. When inside you begin to feel that anger rise up and you want to just spew out over everybody, Allow the Holy Spirit to give you self-control that you're able to control that in your life. Rather than producing a work of the flesh, you produce the fruit of the Spirit by controlling your anger. James says, be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to become angry. Conclusion. As believers, we need to develop skills as a good listener to other people. We need to do that. That is an important ministry that we can have. Number two, we also need to develop listening skills as learning to hear God direction in our lives. Thirdly, we need to be careful to guard what we say. And I use that word guard. Guard, because it was in that verse in Proverbs. We need to guard what we say. And lastly, we need to control our anger. Now, oh, I thought I had one more there, Mike. I don't. Let's close in prayer. Father, I pray that we would take this very practical verse from the book of James Father, and we would apply it in our lives. We would, Father, be quick to listen. Realize that listening is an act of love towards others, Father. You listen to us because of your love for us. Help us to listen. Help us to guard our mouths and be careful what we say. And, Father, to be slow to anger, to have self-control in our lives. Father, I pray that you will produce the fruit of self-control in our lives. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Shall we stand?